there any evidence that Martin Luther wrote the catechism, Luther's small catechism? And the reason I say that, I'm from St. Paul, and that's the biggest Lutheran seminary in the world. I called him up, and uh, one of the professors there said he didn't know, but if you find out, let me know. The reason I was uh, concerned about it or interested in about it, I'm an ex-Lutheran, and uh, I heard a testimony of a priest one time, and he was talking about the Catholic catechism had the second commandment out of it. And I thought, well, Luther's small catechism, he sure would have had that in there. And I see the Lutheran catechism doesn't have the second commandment. Also, if Luther did write something like that, I've read some other things about Luther, and if he was here today, he wouldn't be in a church like this, apparently, because he's written some bad things about uh, the rebaptizers. And if that is true, was Martin Luther even saved, even though he said the just shall live by faith? And you, you kind of know what that controversy is there? All right. Um, Martin Luther's a character and a half. And uh, the way that thing works, the, take, take your Bible and get uh, uh, for, uh, Second Chronicles. And get uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 29 in one hand. And, no, get uh, Exodus chapter 20 and the other. Now, to answer your question, and we'll get it from Chronicles here in a minute for type, and the second commandment, Exodus 20, the answer to your question is that the catechism put together by Luther is put together by Luther and Melanchthon. And Melanchthon takes over after Luther dies. And Melanchthon is pro-Catholic, much more pro-Catholic than Luther. And there's an order of defection of the Catholic Church and church history you need to master, and it's the defection of the people in the Reformation. The one that stays closest in to the Catholic Church during the Reformation is Stauffitz. And Stauffitz is Martin Luther's confessor who got him into the Bible to start with. And Stauffitz is a saved man, but he stays in the church, in the Dominican monks, and stays in the Catholic Church. The next in order of defection is Erasmus, who doesn't stay in as close as Stauffitz. And Erasmus stays in and doesn't come out, but he criticized the Catholic Church strongly. His in praise of folly is a masterpiece. And Erasmus is the first one to issue a missionary a challenge to the heathen. He's the first one. And presents the Receptus. But then out a little bit further, come out a little bit further from, that, from, from Erasmus is Melanchthon, who comes out a bit further. He doesn't come out as far as Martin. And as a consequence, when Martin is dead, Melanchthon does a lot of damage. All right, then you come out to Martin, and Martin goes out further. He makes a clean break, but he didn't make a clean break to start with. He tried to reform from inside, and then got busted clean out. But then further out is Karlstadt, and Karlstadt's further out than Luther, and Luther won't back up what Karlstadt does. Karlstadt go around busting images, breaking images. He's an iconoclast. And then out, out here, further, is us, <laughs> Anabaptists. The Anabaptists, the rebaptizers, and that's Hubmeyer and Storch and Stubner and that bunch. And that bunch are way out here. And some of them are for killing priests. They're killing... <laughs> 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 They're for busting the images and tearing down the monasteries and burning the nunneries and killing the priests. And Luther won't go that far. So Luther is sitting there is about in the middle. And the way this thing works is in... There's a kind of a divine order about this thing that, that almost never fails. In First Chronicles, you find here, when, when uh, David dies, the son takes over and is a man of peace. First Chronicles uh, 28. First Chronicles 28, 2. Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the cover of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and made ready for the building, 28.2. 28.3, But God said to me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war. Well, that's Luther. A man of war, and I shed blood. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before the house of my father. And then five, he chose Solomon. Is that word Solomon? See what that thing is? That's Shalom. Solomon, Shalom, peace, the son of peace. That's what Solomon is. I will establish his kingdom, and so forth and so on. Now, what you have here is a man who's a 
spent his time out killing and never lost a battle. There are three men that never whipped in battle. And those three men are Joshua, David, and Oliver Cromwell. Those three fellows never lost a battle anywhere. They won every battle they got into. And David is a man of war. He fights all his life. He's a rip-roaring, hell-for-leather type of soldier. And because of that, his temptations are physical. It's, it's red blood. His temptations are to adultery. They're fleshy because he is a, he's, a, he's physical. Now, Solomon takes over after David dies. You know that Solomon doesn't have the trouble that David had? David doesn't murder anybody to get his wife. You know what Solomon, you know what God holds against Solomon? Idolatry. That old boy sinned the spiritual. His wives turn away his heart. And Solomon does more damage to the kingdom than David did. Matter of fact, Solomon did so much damage that the Lord said, I'm going to split the kingdom after he dies, which David did more damage to himself personally. I mean, Solomon never had to have to reap what David had to reap. He had to reap all kinds of stuff because of his personal life. But David's fellowship with God never got as bad as Solomon's fellowship with God did. And the thing went apart. Now, you want to you wanna, you wanna understand that. Because that thing is Luther. Luther's a man of war. He's, his, his speeches, they say, are verbal battles. <laughs> and the, the writers say he always reserve a, had a large reserve of juicy, forcible epithets for those that disagreed with him. Um, he gets close to cussing in his preaching, like J. Frank Norris. Those, those fellows are battlers. And he called King Henry now that damnable rottenness. <laughs> what a thing to call a king. You know, don't revile, don't speak evil of dignitaries. His majesty, that worm, that damnable rottenness, granted that he is a defender of the faith, yet it is a defender of that purple-clad abomination of harlots. I mean... Dost thou not hear this old pope, not holy but most sinful? Would God would cast your throne down to hell? Who are you to think that you can? I mean, that guy, he's strong. And Luther is given to overstatement. He's now, once he got mad at the Anabaptists because they were causing a, a, a revolutionary, a peasants' war, a public upheaval, well, Martin Luther, like a good crowd, he's going to obey orders. Befail is befail. He's going to obey the government. So he made some statements about the Anabaptists very strong about wiping them out and killing them. But not because they disagreed with the baptism, because they were revolting against the government, and a good German doesn't believe in disobeying the powers that be. Folks, Germany's history is not filled with civil wars and revolutions. They only had one. It was a Catholic Protestant revolution, the Thirty Years' War. The rest of the time they do what they're told when they're told to do it, unlike these other countries. So Martin Luther made some strong statements, and Martin can make them. I mean, Martin used to say, every Christian should be a good sinner, a good, strong, healthy sinner. Every Christian should, you know, I'd get drink and have a good time and trifle with a young maiden and sport for a while just so the devil doesn't get an advantage over it. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, I know what he meant. See, I know what he meant. He meant, once you're saved, you're always saved. You couldn't go to hell if you tried. But don't try. <laughs> See? And a lot of those things Luther said, people use later on, they really got him good with them. I mean, he'd, you know, he'd, he'd put down the brew. He enjoyed some good more once in a while, man. When somebody got on him by one time, he said, well, uh, I crucified myself and denied myself so much before I was saved, the Lord owes me a little bit now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and then he, beside that, he said, I want to have the worms have a good fat doctor to feed upon. See, I mean, he'd, he'd say some strong things. Now, those things there are, those are overstatements, and I'm given to that. I'm given to that. I admit that. I admit that. I'll put a thing strong. You need to put it. It don't need to be put that strong. But uh, you don't understand because you're not irritated. <laughs> I mean, if I could just quit reading books, I could be a lot more peaceful to get along with. But when you read, it irritates you. They keep attacking this book, see, and it just galls me. This book is all I've had that kept me from falling a thousand times. I've been out in motels and hotels up and down this country at 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock in the morning when things weren't right at home, and I've been out there with no results and in poor health with a call girl's phone in, the whiskey bottle in the room next door, and let me tell you something, brother, the only thing that ever kept me on my feet was that book. And if that had been for that book, I'd have fallen a hundred times. They get going after that book, it gets my goat, boy, and I get reeving, I get slobbering. And I admit, I stepped, I was 
just the bounds sometimes. You don't have to be that hard with it. But uh, I get uh, get stirred up and say some things maybe I shouldn't say. And uh, Luther does the same way. And you take Martin Luther, he was given to overstatement. And those Anabaptists, he said some things perhaps he shouldn't have said. Now, if you read that church history volume one, you'll find one place there when one Baptist pastor down there in Switzerland got martyred, old Martin Luther had nothing but good to say about him. He said he was a fine man, a spiritual son, and loved the Lord, was a fine example of what a Christian should be. And I've always had hopes, which maybe were vain, but I've always had hopes that if Martin Luther had lived another 20 years, he'd have moved over to the Baptist position, which is kind of a vain hope. Because even if he'd seen it was right, he probably wouldn't have moved. That is, when Rommel sees that Hitler's wrong, he's still obeying order. And when Stalingrad gets his pistol with the last round to blow his brains out as a field marshal, he still doesn't retreat when he could have saved his army. And the, the, the Germans are just, I hate to say it, they're just, they're bullheaded. You're German, aren't you? You're German? Yeah, <laughs> Lutheran? Uh huh. Well, you know, a, 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 a liberal German is more bullheaded than a bullheaded Dutchman. Let me show you how bullheaded Germans are. I've been saved 38 years. And the first time a guy pulled a King James Bible on me and said, Do you believe that's the Word of God? I said, Yep, that's it. Now, 38 years later, you know what I believe? <laughs> <laughs> Just what I believe then. You say, well, you obstinate, bullheaded? Yeah, that's very true. Very true. And it has its disadvantages. I mean, it's best to be flexible when dealing with the Lord. It's best to be willing. And if you get too bullheaded, Lord, I have to break your back and break your neck to get you to open your eyes, see. So, when Luther said a lot of those things, he probably didn't mean if he'd seen the light, he probably wouldn't have come across. Him and his ringley are sitting at a table, and his ringley and him are disagreeing on transubstantiation. And Zwingli holds the Baptist position, although Zwingli is reformed. And Zwingli says the Lord's Supper is just a memorial. And Luther said, no, the Lord is present there. Although you don't change the bread and wine into the Lord, transubstantiation, the Lord is present when you take it. He's present with the elements, consubstantiation. See? And Zwingli said, no, they no con, they no trans, it's just a memorial. Zwingli took the Baptist position, but Luther wouldn't give in to it. And that way Luther stayed a little bit Catholic through the thing. And his buddy Melanchthon went further. Now, before we get into this thing in the Catechism, the Second Commandment, I want to show you this Luther Melanchthon thing. Every armor, every army has in it a General MacArthur. And for every General MacArthur, there's a General Westmoreland. Now there's a difference. Every army has in it a general of vinegar, Joe Stilwell. And then right opposite him is a general Bradley, Omar Bradley. You know what I'm saying? You know, study tactics, invasion in the Sicily and Italy at Anzio and Salerno. Every army has a Truscott and then a Lucas. Lucas makes the Anzio beachhead invasion, doesn't press on in, almost lost a division. And then Truscott got him in. I'll put it this way. Every army has a general Patton. And then as a General Eisenhower. Have you got the thing yet? <laughs> All right, it's like that. Like that. And I'm not saying that these gentle, gentlemanly type of Christians are worthless, and I'm not saying they're useless. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't be one. You don't have to be a roughneck like me. I've just been a roughneck all my life. I enjoy... When I get home off the plane, I take my shoes off. I mean, I take them off. I don't put on slippers and socks. I take my shoes off and go out in the backyard and kick rocks, <laughs> walk around the dirt, and go on the beach at night. My idea of a good time is fishing in hurricane warnings with waves five feet high in December and waving out there in the waves. You know, I enjoy that, you see. You wouldn't believe it. I'll get that back this minute, but just something personal. Uh, I hate to say this. This is so carnal. I mean, if I could just be spiritual like some of my brethren and some of my peers, but I'm just, I'm just so carnal. Uh, did you know, you know why I'm happiest and feel the most like I think Pete Ruckman ought to feel? <laughs> well, it's not when I'm preaching. 
or teaching. And God called me to teach, and I enjoy teaching, but I don't feel, I'm not, I don't feel like, like I'm supposed to feel, whatever that is. You know, I guess women understand that kind of thing. You know, you know, you know, you know what I feel like? I feel like I'm supposed to feel. When I'm in front of a fishing net with a mattress on, and people shooting frozen rubber at me. I feel more at home playing goalie in front of a hockey net than anything in this earth. Isn't that strange? Something about that thing just intrigues me, man. I get there, I like every nerve just stretched like that. Just as tight as a string. And the sweat just streaming off your face, and your eyes bugging, and the bullets coming at you. I feel so at home that way. I just feel so natural. I feel so relaxed. <laughs> I mean, that's the greatest thing in the world. I was buying hockey equipment up in Rochester, and they were talking about the guy. He's selling Cooper equipment, you know. And he says, well, you know, they say all goalies got to be crazy. <laughs> I guess maybe you do. But I feel home there. I've got an associate named Jane McGee. He's a good preacher. A really good preacher. He preached a hide off a mule. And he gets kind of rough and kind of wild, but, but it's just uh, he's a... More of a gentleman I am. He's just more refined and more quieter and more conservative, more I am, you know. And you get those two, and they just, I'm not saying one's bad and another's good. I'm saying there's a difference. Well, let me tell you something. If you're the first kind, if you like MacArthur and Patton and J. Frank Norris and Carl Lackey and that bunch, there's something you got to look out for. you got to look out for overdoing it and being too stiff and too inflexible and too uncompromising you got to watch out for that. That's your weak place. And if you tend to be a gentleman and be sociable and be kind and considerate, that won't be your weak place. Your weak place will be in compromise and cutting corners. you got to know what kind you are. Now, let's, let's run it down. Bob Jones, Sr. You got the type? You know Bob Jones, Sr.? Bob Jones, Jr. We'll try it again. M.R. DeHaan. You know M.R. DeHaan? Richard. You got it yet? Let's try it again. Charlie Fuller. You got it? Dan Fuller. Try one more time. Jack Hiles? Whoever the next one is. <laughs> now, see that thing? Oh, it's got Martin Luther. There's something, there's something about, I'll never understand it. But there's some about have to come up a hard, rough, tough way and get skinned and go through trouble and trial and break ice and break new ground. There's some about that that does something for you that you cannot get any other way. And I'll never understand it, but I know it's so. And the fellow comes along that comes on and inherits it, there's something he just doesn't go through in coming up. And so your problem here is that catechism. And that catechism is originally put together by Luther and Melanchthon. But after Luther dies, Melanchthon puts it out. And if anybody messed with that second commandment, it would have been Melanchthon. And I'll show you why, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. There's only one church in Detroit that doesn't have a second commandment. How do you know what it is? Let me see your hands. Are you Yankees ought to have more sense than that? What's the matter with you? What do you... What do you spend all your time doing anyway? You ought to study this stuff. Exodus 20, verse 1. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. First commandment, thou shalt have no other God before me. Second commandment, thou shalt not make to thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or earth beneath, or in the water on the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, <laughs> because the Lord thy God is a jealous God. You're not to go around that Via Dolorosa and kneel in front of them statues, sit that toe three in a row. So you got one. So you got one church in this town that doesn't have any second commandment. It's the Roman Catholic Church. You saw they get ten. They bust that last one down into two. Isn't that a wild thing? You see verse 17. They've got two commandments out of verse 17. What a bunch of crooked people! And Detroit just filled with them. Just fill with them. Some of your relatives and kinfolk take that last commandment, bust it down to two in order to get rid of the one that condemned them for the dirty, rotten sins. 
Now look at verse 5. Now if anybody fool with that, malignant, fool with that, not Martin. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them or serve them. Now here's what you want to get. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation that will hate me. Now that's the only sin that God promised to visit on your children. The only sin that goes inherited, so the wrath goes down to the generations, is idolatry. And that explains why South America and Mexico are the condition they're in. Because it doesn't end with one generation. It goes third and fourth, the next generation third and fourth, the next generation third and fourth, right on down. To answer your question, brother, is I'm sure that Martin didn't take it out, and if you have any change in the catechism now that wasn't right, Melanchthon was the author of it. And in regard to the baptism, Luther's position on baptism is inconsistent. His position is a man is saved by grace through faith plus nothing, but sprinkling the baby guarantees the child is going to get saved. And that's inconsistent. And that's where Martin was inconsistent. They all have a whole new honor. That's Martin's hole. Yes, sir. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a college education.